Welcome back to Chat Shit. We've just finished the graveyard shift at Marvel. For any of you that bet on Kelly Underwood to be commentating that game, rake in the money. Uh, also, I was at the Swans game today. I was very happy. I'm now feeling very content for this podcast. How did you find the weekend? I, this was a great, great round. The Essendon edge again. Mm. Uh, we saw the Bulldogs were going to get hold of the Saints. The Comeback Kings, the Premiers are back. West Coast, who, who, who saw that win coming? Yeah, we'll chat so much about that. That's, I think everyone's excited that we might have, well, maybe not North, but maybe 17 competitive teams now. Mm. West Coast, you don't want to face them right now with the confidence they've got. I mean, are Geelong the best team in the competition? Carlton looking awesome with injuries. But yeah, let's jump straight into the top five. I'll go right into mine. So this is the top five players of the round. I've got Elliot Yo sitting at my number five. Um, I mean, at the moment, I think he's in the All-Australian squad. I know you agree with that. Um, consecutive games he's getting. I think there was a stat, like, he didn't have three consecutive games for the last, like, two years or something before this year. 26 disposals, a goal, nine score involvement, six clearances, and a huge part in West Coast being competitive. Yep. Because you've got... We'll talk about Harley Reid soon, I'm sure, but... Kelly, he's a guy who likes to receive the ball on the outside, and it seems like Harley Reid's sort of that guy as well, likes to receive it and burst through a stoppage. And Elliot Yeo's really getting in there, getting those contested possessions and winning the ball. Yeah, he's yeah, he's added in his dual All Australian form, which he has, and who knows if he'll add a third to it. But the way he's playing this season, he's absolutely been one of the best. I heard. I don't know if you saw the article. He went to Qatar in the preseason and did some crazy recovery thing. I believe it, and whatever it is. That's got to be some magical secret because when like the way that he plays, which requires so much physicality and athleticism, like you sort of thought he'll never get back anywhere near that level after all the injuries he's had and being a bit older. But gosh, he's absolutely dominating. Yeah, I think dominating West Coast, a strong midfield yeah, for you. I think West Coast are managing him perfectly as well. Like he doesn't have the most time on ground, but he's really impactful when he's on. Absolutely. So they're, they're doing a great job with him. Well, let's get your number five. My number five is Harley Reid, so we don't okay. have to talk much longer. But he actually, we'll talk about Harley Reid. He was phenomenal. The kid uh, can play. The kid can play. He doesn't have to rack up disposals to have an, a, like one of the highest levels of impact on the well, ground. I'll just say here, my note, I've got him at number three, but I've said yeah. 19 damaging touches. Absolutely. You have guys like, uh, guys like Sam Flanders, who today... I'm a big fan of Sam Flanders, but in the current role he has at Gold Coast, he had 35 disposals today, I think, and about 33 of them were 15 meter kicks sideways or backwards. Uh, so, Similar to Nick Martin. So yeah, so and he, he wasn't very impactful. Actually, had a few clangers. Except then you look at Harley Reid, who had 19 possessions. Three of them were huge, crucial goals. Massive hangers massive, as yeah, well. Massive hangers. 13 contested possessions. Yeah, and then as you say, bursting away from stoppage, always looking dangerous. And just throwing seven clearances as well. Why not? Yeah, sticking tackles when it when it's his job to do that. Yeah. Absolutely amazing and so exciting. I think he's got uh, the rising star locked away if he stays. Oh, 100%. Big. I actually looked at the odds after that game. It's at $1.50 at the moment. $1.30 now? $1.30 now. Okay, it is going down. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'm assuming, number four. Yeah, yeah, my number four was Sam Walsh. So, yeah, it didn't take long to get back to his best. I mean, 35 disposals, 17 score involvements, um, three goal assists, six clearances, and 80%. Um, this is a guy we sort of not really forgot about, but we didn't know, I don't think we remembered how good he was for Carlton. And he's come back in and we saw what they've done to the GWS midfield. I think they completely ran over ran over him. Him and another guy, I think we're going to talk about yep. in, in, in yep. a short period of time. Yeah. Uh, see, interestingly, I thought they were, both of those players were great, Yo and Walsh. I didn't quite have them in my top five and I don't think you'll have my number four either. Okay. I have Will Hoskin Elliott. I didn't. I did not have him, but that's actually fine. I'm going to mention him later in the podcast. But yeah, go on. Yeah. So we we said you mentioned earlier that Collingwood are back to their sort of rampaging best this week, and they've now won three on the trot. Uh, and I think you'd be silly to to want to play them in finals. I think they're a terrifying prospect. Uh, the reigning premiers are now in now in some good form, and Will Hoskin Elliott was phenomenal. Well, I'm yeah. going to say it here. It's part of one of the notes I have in my hits later. But I've got Will Hoskin Elliott looked like a prime Jeremy Cameron for about two quarters in that game. He took, I think, three huge contested marks, mm. like uh, sort of like Harley Reid did in the West Coast game, but not as deep forward. Kicked two beautiful goals, mm. got 20 plus touches, and was just really impactful. And just what he always works so hard defensively as well as a winger. And so when when he's having impact going forward too, it has it has a big effect on Collingwood's on Collingwood's outcome. And he was just magnificent. So one of those guys, like. Probably one of those guys that would be considered a bottom six player for Collingwood on, on talent and based on his name, but he was amazing. 
I'll get you to give me your number three. Yeah, mine was Harley Reid. My number three is Aaron Norton. Okay. I wonder if you have him in there. I didn't have him in there. Okay. Six goals and just kicked the ball like an absolute arrow. Is it six goals nothing? Six goals nothing, I think. So you I can think check I'm, that. Check that while I'm talking. Yeah, I will. But I think it needs to be appreciated when a forward really just takes all yeah, their opportunities. Because yeah, you see a lot of performances, especially these days, where key forwards are kicking two goals for or something. You think, oh, it's a two-goal performance. And if they kicked as straight as Aaron Norton did this week, it's a six-goal performance. Well, I mean, there was weight on his shoulders with no Hugo Hagen as well. Mm. So, and not, yeah. There were some really tough kicks in there as well. So taking big marks, converting, uh, you got to show some appreciation. I have him at number three. My number two is Paddy Cripps. So... 39 disposals, 24 contested possessions, 11 score involvements, 7 tackles, 13 clearances, and he was the captain in that game. In um, a huge win in against a GWS. Massive, a massive game where I think the favourites were definitely GWS, I feel like, going in. But, I mean, we saw pretty quickly which midfield was on top. Like, him and Walsh were really awesome in that game. I assume you've got him as well. I've got Cripps at number one. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough. And I'm trying to think of some wordplay around Navy and Tsunami because Tsunami's in the water. Yeah, okay. But because they really like made GWS look look like average and unfit for parts of that game, which no one's been able to do. Like St Kilda sort of caught them lacking late last week, uh, caught GWS lacking late last week. But uh, that was sort of late in the game when I think GWS got, I've got it. it. The blue tsunami have flooded the Harbour City. It's awful. Okay. That sounds like ChatGPT if you asked it to make a pun about it. Uh, but yeah, he was amazing. Uh, yeah, him and Walsh together were magnificent. And yeah, Paddy Cripps at his best is an absolute like inspiration for his teammates with just how hard he goes at it. Well, I'll go to my number one now. Yeah, my no, number... I'll, no, well, I'll go two. I'll go oh, two. Okay, okay, sure. At two, I have Jordan Dawson. Okay. He's fair. your number one? No, he's not. So I don't have your number one in my list. You do list. not have my number one. I'm very surprised you don't have this guy in your list. Okay, well, I'll quickly mention Jordan Dawson, who in a losing performance, and I'll talk about later, should not have been a losing performance for Adelaide. Um, he was amazing and back to his best form. Uh, it looks like he's found a role, or just he's just found something where we know what he can do, but he's just been really poor for his standards to start the year. And then this week, he was phenomenal. Two goals, 30 plus, seven tackles, effective with the fo- with the football which is the main thing you know about Jordan Dawson. But who'd you have at number one? I had Bailey Dale. At, yeah, he's, he was my honourable mention. number one. Dawson was my honourable mention. But, okay. I mean, he was the sub, I think, last week or the week before. And he's, he's almost like a big F off to Bevo here. He's 39 touches, a goal, 29 kicks at 92%. He took 15 marks. That game is, is what we're looking for, for like from an all-Australian halfback. He should never be the sub. It's the service that those Bulldogs forwards are, are, have been praying for. I mean, Hugo Hagen's going to love that when he comes back in. This is a guy who I know we've talked about a potential for super coaches if he has this role every week. Mm. I absolutely loved his game. Completely tore apart a pretty solid St. Kilda defense. And honestly, probably played more of a midfielder this game because of how dominant um, the Bulldogs were and how high up on the pitch he was. But yeah, I just loved his all-round game. His kicking was great. Norton loved it. I think it was like three goal assists as well. Yeah, 39 cheapies at the back. But let's move on. Uh, we on to the quiz. We got another quiz? We do have a quiz. Okay, quiz cool. for this week. We'll jump straight in. So it's the top five most career goals of active players. Okay. Okay, I think you might get it in, in five or six. I remember last week you said you're going to get it in six, and it took about 12 or 13 guesses. Yeah, I'm instantly blanking, but I'll go Tom Hawkins. Number one, 790. I'll go Jeremy Cameron. Number three, 598. I'll go Taylor Walker. Taylor Walker, number two, 619. I'm going to guess Joe Danaher. Joe Danaher's not in the top 10. Not in the top 10? No. Then I've got no clue. I, I was going to say Toby Green. Also not in the top 10. And we're looking for a top five. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, Jack Darling. Jack Darling's number five, 514. And then Luke Bruce is going to be on. Luke Bruce is number four, 529. Okay, okay, good. Well, okay. I think was that. Found the radar at the end. Seven, seven, seven guesses. guesses. Seven guesses. Yeah, Just a couple good. really bad ones. Yeah, one of your one of your better performances yeah. in, in the quiz section. Yeah. Well, we'll move straight on to uh, hits and misses. So I'll kick us off with both of my misses. Okay, let's go. So it was similar to what I said last week, but St Kilda going forward, their their ball movement with Sinclair, who's had a few games now, and he's almost not even been trusted at half back. He's played a bit of forward time. Wangani Malira hasn't been great since round one. Um, ball movement hasn't looked anything like it did last year nine goals again by the way so it's been nine it's just they can't kick more than nine goals you can't win games kicking nine goals I'll go to my second miss because it's very similar but 
three or below 70 points in the last four weeks. They can't rely on defense all the time. They're not going to win nearly enough low-scoring games like that. I know we we like we look at their defense. Pierce has been awesome. Ryan's been great. Draper's come in and played a role. But it's the way Frio play is just chipping the ball around a lot, getting exactly. a lot of touches for their defenders and midfielders. And I don't. I just don't think they trust themselves going long to their forward line because of how how weak the personnel in their forward mm-hmm. line is. I think that's an external and an internal perception that they just don't have a lot of strong guys in there, especially with Jaya Miss getting injured quite early in that game. They just don't feel like they have a target that they can go to and be confident in. They just think they're going to get intercepted and get dominated if they try to send it deep. So they try to chip it around and they, they get nowhere. But yeah, it's it's a pretty like sad watch, to be honest. They're watching a team that just tries to win these low-scoring games doesn't really go forward with a lot of penetration. I mean, they've got Jackson, who should be playing a bit of forward time down there. I know he's a target. I know in the trade period... They're potentially looking at Logan McDonald if he doesn't type his future at the Swans. So they, they're very aware that they need a key forward. Mm. But as the commentator sort of said against the, in the game against West Coast this week, Fremantle have really high hopes for this year. Starting 3-0, and not just against three bad teams. They played some really good footy and something's, something's not clicking. They're not able to score any points. Um, but I'll move on to my misses. One, Draper fell on the ball and I think it happens six seconds or five seconds did, before the siren. Did the AFL already apologise? They've already yeah, apologised yeah. before the end of the round. I mean, that, what does that mean? They're not going to yeah. get any points. Uh, they also apologised to Adelaide for the Ben Keys incident in the final round of last year. Mm. And yeah, I don't think the apology will mean, the apologies mean much to Adelaide fans. Um, well, Adelaide are done for the year. Adelaide are done for the year and this was a chance for them to be back two and four. Uh, like with, like that, that's back and that's really, really tough. That was a very obvious holding the ball, twenty out straight. In front. Did you see the Maybe clip out of um, Draper after the game when he was walking around like they were shaking hands? He did like a thing. He like sort of fell on the ground because he knew exactly what he did. Yeah, did you see that? It wasn't oh in front gosh. of them. It was like with ah, the, with, okay, okay. With just joke around guys. with the boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he knew what he was doing. Yeah, but that's just a that's just a, that was a big miss by the umpire. The other miss is if West Coast were ugly last year, North are ugly this year. Yeah, it's disappointing. We're really expecting. A lot more from them. Yeah, they. I. Uh, we were expecting a lot more than this. Just mm. they play. They don't seem to have an exciting game style, or they, I guess they try to, but the execution is very poor. They make just so many errors, so many out on the fools that I saw today. And I'm gonna say, Kelly Underwood was not the worst thing about that game. That was North Melbourne. Yeah. Oh, I mean, debatable. Um, but the the football they're playing is quite ugly, and they're not a strong team either. When you look at the sort of base that they're building, which they do have a lot of talented players. I'd say, you look at a lot of those guys, it's based on sort of skill and I don't know what I'm looking for, but it's not power and physicality. Well, we know that defense is a massive weakness. And I thought it was just tall forwards, but apparently they're just soft. They can't handle small forwards, medium-sized forwards, definitely not tall forwards. Yeah. Um, Their midfield is getting smashed. LDU looks far from the player he has been in the last couple of years. McCurcher, since he left half back, he's been poor. Has disappeared. Yep. Sheasel cannot be playing half back anymore. He's got to be moved forward and, and have his touches be a lot more damaging than they are. When he gets the chance, he is one of the most damaging players. Oh, 100%. In the league. And I'm sure Larky, Every time Larky up, yeah. and the other forwards must be begging for that. Yep. But yeah, I'll go into to my hits. So yeah, similar to what you, you just said, what we've just talked about, but West Coast are competitive this year. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. My outrageous take was wrong. West Coast are, are going to win more games than last year from what we've seen so far, especially looking at their midfield in, in Reed, Yo, and Kelly, who have been walking through midfields. And they, they've been winning the clearance in, I think, five out of six games so far. Wow. Except, I mean, around the ground, they're lacking a bit of talent. But, I mean, Jake Waterman, who's a sneaky for the Coleman is loving the service. I wouldn't agree with that he's a sneaky for the He's Coleman, a sneaky for the Coleman. He's had two, what, he's kicked, how many did he kick last week? Six? So he's had yeah. 11 in two games. Yeah. He's a genuinely good key forward. And we still Oscar Allen to come back. There I are mean, there are a lot of teams I can think of in the league that would love Jake Waterman as their number one key forward the way he's playing right now. I mean, when things are going well, uh, your key your key players really start to look, like stand out. Like McGovern has been great this year. Barras has been good so far this year. The captain Duggan's been good so far this year. Reed has sort of electrified the club. Yo, Kelly, I think, Waterman. I think everyone would have said, 
at the end of last year and in the preseason. Oh, they had one standout last year, Oscar Allen, mm. and he's not even playing he's not at even the moment. Playing yet, yeah. And they are dominating. So this is amazing. If they haven't just scrapped two wins against other bottom feeders, they've got a forty point win against Richmond, and they just beat Frio, a team that was three and two. I mean, they were competitive against Sydney as well. I mean, Absolutely, they half time. this is three straight fantastic weeks, and that's Sydney, a uh, premier, one of the premiership favourites, the second favourite for the premiership. So yeah, they are really looking. It's just to have suddenly turned things around and what a bit of confidence can do for all those youngsters as well F- suddenly knowing what it feels like to win footy games against solid teams and you know what I love it's Holly Reid his celebration it's the one like grabbing <laughs> the badge yeah like yeah. this is where I'm supposed to be like that's what I think oh, I like it and also I think I'm going to take it back I think West Coast were correct in taking Holly Reid from what we've I seen so far um, he that looks good. he's that good I don't think a, a second or third pick and like a late first rounder comes anywhere near what Harley Reid could turn out to be if he stays long term at the West Coast. Because sometimes it can be the case. If you're being offered a fourth pick, seventh pick, 20th pick, and future picks for the number one, there's no guarantee that that number one will even be better than the oh, number four. 100%. So you take that. But yeah, I don't think I realized quite how good Harley Reid was going to be straight away. He's do- He was dominating Nat Fife and Caleb Sorrell. Did you see physically. the one where he threw yeah. Nat Fife to the ground? As a 19 year old, he's yeah. dominating these guys physically. And against Richmond, he was doing the same against against Dusty, you know, the, the yeah, fend off. Yeah. As a, it's it's quite ridiculous, uh, and it's exciting for West Coast. It's great to see them being competitive, and mm-hmm. I hope it continues. Also, just turned nineteen like three days ago. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, ridiculous what he's doing so far. We're absolutely yeah. loving it. My second hit is the premiers are back. From what we saw in their game, pressure, ball movement, comeback kings. It was a seventy-three point turnaround. Nick Dacos had an awesome second half, especially then that fourth quarter. And like we mentioned earlier. Hoskin Elite looked like prime Jeremy Cameron for a couple of quarters there. So that's exactly what we're looking for from Collingwood. They were up against it. Port, I think, had like a 30-odd point lead. They were cruising. Looked like it was going to be a walkover. And then they suddenly get the crowd with them. They start nine straight goals? Something, something like ridiculous like that. Uh, I think it was not yet. Yeah, nine out of... The, the, yeah, it, it was nine straight goals. Um, and they, they just dominated the game from their first goal that they kicked in. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, they're back. Calling was back. Yeah, my hits are Carlton dominating while injured. They have an entire. I think I saw a funny Daniel Gorringe video. We were saying we have an entire AFL team, like a top eight team of injured players, um, which is not quite the case. But they seriously have a lot of talent that has injuries and particularly hamstring injuries. But they were amazing against GWS. Have that seem to have that next man up mentality. I don't know if Four Seasons stealing that or just whatever the leadership group. They really everyone that's coming into the team to to make is not just making up the numbers. They're having an impact. Um, and we've talked previously about the talent that they have in that team. Mackay and Kerno both in full flight. Both two of I'd say two maybe the two common favourites in my mind on the same team. Uh, they're not. It doesn't seem to be. Ta- they don't seem to be taking goals and taking contests away from each other. They're working together perfectly to separate and make sure that if Chicano's taking two defenders, that means that Mackay's got a one-on-one and vice versa. So when you combine that with Walsh and Cripps tearing apart midfields, it's absolutely dangerous. Well, their key position players are really starting to stand yeah. up. I mean, Wiedering is is an awesome player. I definitely think he's he could be that All-Australian uh, key back alongside Sam Taylor. Uh, but yeah, Crips, Welsh, I mean, it's unfortunate, but yeah, Carlton are good. Yeah. I'll, I don't know if it's unfortunate. I quite like seeing the, yeah. this Carlton team because they're, okay. they're an exciting team to watch. My second hit, I want to argue that Swans at the SCG are now the toughest fixture in the AFL. And that's the history of a lot last year and this year, what Sw- oh, and the year before, what Swans have been at the SCG when they have a somewhat fit team like uh, we had a period of some bad injuries last year in the middle of the year but they the way that they use the dimensions of the SCG it's so difficult for other teams to adjust we just the Swans just go through the midfield uh, using Blakey Goulden uh, Braden Campbell when he's uh, when he's on and these sort of guys ball use and they just tear teams to shreds and just get from their transition from full back to full forward is so quick and punishing and I haven't seen a team yet at the SCG be able to refute it. 
I'm going to contest that and say Geelong and GMHBA are better than the Swans are at the SCG. And that's, I think, that's the toughest test in footy at the moment, the way Geelong's okay, playing. That's, that's fair cool. And I would have said Brisbane, but they're over three at the Gabba, so forget it. That's why I said now, it, mm. at the end of last season, that's there was fair. no argument that so Brisbane I, at the Gabba. I'd say us and, and Geelong at home yep. would, would be the two best teams. We'll move straight into our, our next segment, the, the lauded footy pyramid. We have some changes. As usual, we have people moving down quite a bit. We have people moving up just a bit. On the fringes is Errol Goulden, who started in the pyramid. He's sort of making his way back. Needs a couple more consistent performances. We have two outs this week. Tom Green is out of the pyramid. Hasn't been himself lately, the last three, four weeks. He's sort of, he started in the second tier, and every single week, he started to slowly move down. Look, 15's a small number. Hard to stay there. (laughs) It is true. Tom Stewart is out of the pyramid. It's unfortunate he got injured early, but I just think there's other guys that does really deserve to be in the top 15. We're ruthless out here. In the fifth tier, Connor Rosie has moved down two tiers. It was a bit of a <laughs> it was a bit of a jump on last week. You're right. What did I say? Yeah, I was tempted to take him out, but he <laughs> I, I'm still I'm still happy for him to be in my top 15 players. Butters holds his spot. If he can put a, if he can put together a full full quarter performance, he's going to shoot up this pyramid. He seems to have one or two explosive quarters. Uh, Sam Walsh is in the pyramid. He was on the fringes last week. Another awesome game. He's only played two games this year, but he he can definitely move well up the pyramid. Uh, Elliot Yo is Love in it. the pyramid. Love it. I think 100% deserved. He, I don't think he's had a bad game this year. Every game, consistent, he's fighting, getting touches, clearances. Yeah, I think he just definitely deserves to be in this pyramid. And Zach Merritt holds his spot. In the fourth tier, Charlie Kerno holds his spot. Sarong holds his spot. Lockie Neal moves down. Okay. Plays not because he's been bad, but I think other people have, have been in performance. Sam Taylor's moved up in the, in the pyramid, I'll not be playing. YouTube. I'm going to explain. He wins I, to the bye. He beats the bye. He is beaten the bye. <laughs> he's not only beaten the bye by staying, he's beaten the bye and moved up. And I'm going to explain it. Because, can I explain it for you? I know you're going to say Okay, you can explain it for me. Without the, without Sam Taylor there, you could see the difference in GWS's backline. 100%. Mm-hmm. I don't think... I, I, think, I think GWS win the game if Sam Taylor's there. He's I'm that just, good. I'm just going to point that out. And, and that's why he moves up. He's Kurt that good. Kai, they had no and answer. I think now I've seen what can happen when he's not there. Mm. And yeah, he moves up. In the third tier, Nick Dacos holds his spot. A strong second half comeback from him. Cripps moves up a tier. An elite performance. And the bot moves up a tier after falling a couple tiers in the, in the recent weeks. The top three stay the same. Petrarca and Gorn in the second tier and, he- and Heaney on top. So Petrarca and Gorn don't lose to the bye. They don't lose to the bye. No, they, they're going to hold their spot this I'm week. I'm loving this pyramid. You're loving so the pyramid? So is Dacos out of it right now? No, Dacos, no, said in, the, he's in the third, third tier. tier. He's in the third Good. tier. He's held his spot for he a had great game, yeah. But yeah, that's the pyramid. It's sitting right in front of you here. Let me know what you think down below if you'd make any changes. No Holly Reid in the fringes. Also. No Holly Reid in the I thought about Holly Reid in the fringes, but I think that's a little bit early. Okay, time for the power rankings. There were massive upsets all over the league this week. I was... At the at the game today, one of my one of my mates said to me he was zero from six in tipping before the Swans... Uh, zero from six in tipping until last late last night. So... Now we're going to get into it. In 18th, we have a new number 18. It's the North Melbourne Kangaroos. Not Hold much it, to say. Holding their spot at the bottom. Or we, we noticed that West Coast, uh, they're not at the bottom anymore. And they're above Hawthorne, which they were last week. Yeah. And there's a new team they've jumped. They've jumped Richmond. I like it. I like it. They've jumped Richmond. Richmond have not beaten the bye. Richmond lost to the bye with West Coast performing that way. And West Coast going to 15th. They have two wins. Three straight games where they look like a mid-table team, if not better. And who would have thought West Coast are three off the bottom? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And then I have Adelaide above them. I know Adelaide have one win. West Coast have two. Holding West Coast spot again. West Coast are in better form. But Adelaide... They've been robbed this week. Well, they've lost a couple close games. And they've recently. lost a lot of close games. Then, I have St. Kilda. Dropping a few spots. Dropping three, three spots. spots? Three spots. Absolutely. They don't look good. They can't score. We said it about Fremantle too, and that's why Fremantle are in 12th. How 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 far did they drop That's in? five spots. That's five Fremantle. spots. That's look, fair enough. I, I, I agree with that. As much as we talk up West Coast, there was very little resistance from Frio. There was very little game plan switch to, to start moving the ball better, to start taking on the contest instead of just chipping the ball around. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's fair enough to put Frio here and it's hard to see them coming back well, from this. I mean, if you take away Frio's last quarter, they kick four goals. Yep. I mean, yep. Now in 11, I've got the Bulldogs. 
Go. Okay, moving up two spots. Up two spots. They had a great game. Uh, a, a huge win against St. Kilda, 60 points. That's, yeah, I, I, I don't even think that they were the... F- don't know if they were the favourites going into that I game. I don't think they were, no. So that's, that's another upset, and they, they deserve to go up a couple spots. They could definitely... That we know, as it is every year with the Bulldogs, they'll be a team they fighting the for the list. But yeah, we know they have the list, and we know they'll be fighting for the top eight. I feel eight. like they're just swaying up and down. One week they've got the list, another week they're you know in the middle of a rebuild. So. Absolutely. So yeah, so weird. We've talked about yeah. Bevo's chat around that. So weird. When you look at games yeah. like this week, you're like how is Bevo talking about how their list isn't good enough mm. this year? Anyway, now Gold Coast, I have at ten, moving down two spots. Two spots. Yeah, the the loss to the Swans wasn't impressive, but as I say. It's a tough test that a lot of people, uh, a lot of teams, seem to come off badly playing the Swans at the SCG. And then you know they had five guys who played less than five games, and I think ten guys wow. less than twenty five games. Yeah, they've got a lot of guys coming out of the academy, mm-hmm. like coming into this team. It's it's an exciting team, but you're not always going to be at your best. And it was a tough test this week, which they didn't pass. At number nine, I've got Brisbane. Yep, keeping their spot. Yep, that w- despite the loss against Geelong, it was. A really wet game. Mm. It was hard to judge either team. Geelong seemed to just have it. Brisbane dominated a lot of the ball, but Geelong just had the moments and were able to find goals. Um, but Brisbane keep their spot sort of to do with the fact that the teams around them had poor performances, so like, sort of like Gold Coast, Frio, yeah. St Kilda. Then in number eight, I have Essendon. Jeez, moving up four spots. Four spots. There's so much change this week. Essendon big upsets. edge every week. Four and two, and they seem to be proving that they are a solid team. They seem to have some sort of identity where they have a lot of ball through their halfbacks trying to be as dynam- uh, as dynamic as possible. Martin, McGrath, Redmond, uh, Heppel. So they, they try to move it quickly. And with that new young midfield, have giving Parrish a bit less time, uh, no more Dylan Shield, and giving that time to guys like Caldwell and uh, set a field when he's fit. And Peter Wright to come back next week. Absolutely. Well, to yeah. replace one of the Ruckmen who cannot play forward. So Essendon uh, are, a bit, are impressive at the moment. They don't have a great percentage, but they're four and two, and you got to give them credit. Yeah, wins a win. Number seven, I have Melbourne losing to the bye. Yeah, one spot. One spot. Uh, in number six, I've got Port. Dude, he's down three spots. Down three spots against Collingwood. Collingwood were great, and this is where you're going to see the biggest change of the round. We've got Collingwood in five. Oh, I completely forgot about that. That's plus six spots. That's up six spots. Wow. This was a really impressive performance. Statement. I wanted to have them as one of my hits if you didn't already have them. That's fair enough. It was so impressive. They really showed what they've shown in previous years, which is just overrunning teams, having an energy that the other team just cannot match, uh, and, and it's just overwhelming. I like it. I like it. And I think they, they look like... I, if so you said to me, oh, they're the fifth best team in the league, I'd say absolutely. Form and vibes. I like it. Form and vibes. In number four, I have Carlton. Okay, moving up a spot. Yes. So we have the, the, the final four teams now, all teams that are 5-1 and one or 6-0. and oh. mm-hmm. And I think Carlton are really, really good. But I think there's two teams better, and there's one team that's just got better vibes and form at the moment. That team with better vibes and form is Geelong. Oh, what? I have Geelong in number three. Oh, what? I thought Starting now, for sure there was a different team coming in number three. I thought Geelong was going to be number one. I don't, I don't know the fact, except I think from what I've seen, Geelong have played one team so far that is currently in the top eight. You are, I think you're correct on that. I'll check it while you're... I think they've played one team that are currently in the top eight, and they're not high in the top eight. And then, upcoming now, starting with Carlton next week on Saturday, they have an incredibly tough run of fixtures for the next five or so. And it's got, have they not played a team in the top eight yet? Oh, before, as in the Bulldogs are in the top eight now. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. As, as the game week started, they have not played a team in the top eight. So that's fair enough. They have a I really tough test coming up against Carlton and a tough run after that. And then we'll see where they go. Do they hold their spot around here? Well, are they the best team in the league? Or are they sort of around the fringes of the eight? We're about to find out over the next four to five weeks. In number two, I have Sydney, who were mega impressive today. The bye came at the right time, which we mentioned last week. Swans had two straight poor performances, losing to Richmond in a tight one and then beating West Coast by 20 to 30. Looking back now, that's not as bad as we thought it was at the time with the way West Coast have played in the two games since. But the bye came at the right time. Swans looked to want looked to want to send a message today and they absolutely did. Do you want to give a shout out to, to someone who had a great performance today? Oh, absolutely. We haven't mentioned him. Brody Grundy, I think, was very clearly best on. Uh, my sort of theory that I mentioned to Aiden earlier is that Grundy has had two best on ground performances this year and for the rest of the year has been like okay to good. 
Those two standout games were round zero and today. And those two games are where he's had the most rest. Today after the bye and round zero, fresh first game of the season with a managed preseason. So it seems to me that, and it makes sense with Brody Grundy, that he has all the talent. We know how good he is on the ground and how nifty he is in the, in the, in the ruck contest, but he can only do it so hard for so long. So if Swans can manage him and if he can gain some match fitness throughout the year, I don't know if they rest him or sub him off sometimes t- tactically when yeah. we're dominating games. I think Brody Grundy uh, can really be one of the better ruckmen in the league. I like it. In I number like one, it. I've got GWS. Still holding their spot after the loss. They hold their spot after okay. the loss. This is why it's not just form, it's vibes. I think GWS are still the best team in the league. They're going to have want a to couple of injuries. Have, well. have a couple of key injuries, and they're going to want to send a message well, in the upcoming weeks. Green and Hogan are looking like they're going to miss weeks. Yep. Um, Green definitely is going to miss weeks. He's similar to the thing Peter Wright did, and Hogan potentially sort of had that strike. I don't oh, know if you remember. I don't know if we're sure about Tom Green. I think maybe because he's in Toby my... Green. Oh, yeah, 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 Toby Green. Except I, I think. I don't want him to miss weeks. I know, but it, it was sort of that similar but action he where he's, he's gone for the mark and he's turned and he's got him with the shoulder. Yeah. Which is, I mean, if you look at Peter Wright's one, there's, there's precedent for it. Yeah. But that's that's our power rankings here, or my power rankings. I don't know if you'd agree with them. I like but it. this is what we've got. That's all we have for, for today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Let, let us know down below if you want to see anything else, and we'll see you on the next one.